Well, hello and welcome everybody to the third and final talk of our Planted Unplugged series, Blooming Buildings. My name's Sam Peters and I'm the co-founder of Planted, the first contemporary design show aimed at reconnecting cities with nature. Today, as we explore how design, sustainability, architecture and nature can combine to create cleaner, healthier urban spaces, I'm delighted to welcome three of the UK's leading experts when it comes to understanding regreening. With, with more and more studies demonstrating the mental and physical benefits of being connected to nature, this talk explores how we can ensure cities of the future act not just as places where nature can exist, but indeed where nature can flourish and grow. And I'm delighted to introduce our three guests. First of all, on our far side, Oliver Heath, design guru and Planted's official biophilic design advisor. Indeed, Oliver designed this set that we're sitting on and his team have played an enormous role in delivering this series of talks. Um, Oliver's a wise, a wise man of the Planted team and a valuable contributor to this uh, talk, no less. On my left, Richard Sabin, the co-owner of, uh, indeed, sorry, the, the co-founder of uh, Biotecture, again, whose wonderful wall is behind us. Biotecture's products improve air quality, they look wonderful, and they uh, engage physically and, uh, and mentally with, with people around. I'm sure you'll agree, it's an absolutely wonderful space that's been created in conjunction with Biotech's team. So lovely to see you on, on the panel, Richard. Lastly, but uh, by no means least, to my right, Mac Gilchrist. And Mac is a uh, former model and uh, indeed the uh, founder of the Edible Bus Stop, um, whose projects have inspired thousands of urban gardeners to reconnect with nature and understand the benefits of green spaces. And Mac describes herself as a green space activist. So to my three guests, thank you very much for being part of this uh, third talk today. It's great to have you all here. Um, so where to start? Um, perhaps Oliver, why not with you? What is the problem that we face at this moment in terms of our, how have we lost connectivity with nature and, uh, and what's the problem as you see it? I think the problem that we face is that we tend to take a very short term approach to, to land use. Um, and short-term financial approach without looking at the longer-term benefits that elements uh, that support our health and well-being can bring. So we've started to create cities that are very different to the sorts of spaces that we've evolved in as humans. And yet as human beings, you know, we really haven't developed significantly over the last 200,000 years. So the work that we do looks at our health and well-being from an evolutionary perspective and suggests, well, look, if we've evolved in close connection healthy forms of nature for our, our basic human survival then why are our urban environments so different and actually you know we still have a genetic inheritance that allows us to recognize landscapes that can help us not just to survive but also thrive and flourish and when we see landscapes that can do that it can actually do amazing things to us physiologically it can help to reduce heart rates and blood pressure levels and the net effect of that is is that it can reduce stress and aid physical and mental recuperation so we're now creating these very dense, urban, geometric spaces, crammed with people, with lots of function rammed into them, but very little opportunity to um, stop, to relax, to recuperate, get, to get back to being at our best. And I think as human beings, we're very adaptable. We can squeeze ourselves into them, but what we're increasingly learning is that it doesn't necessarily bring the best out of us. So what the research is that we uncover in our work is that when we bring elements of nature into our cities, into our streets and neighborhoods, and importantly into the buildings that are so important to our lives, it can do amazing things, not just to us individually, but also to help us to connect with one another and recognize that you know, our health and well-being is intrinsically linked to the health and well-being of the nature around us. And that when we have lovely, blossoming, blooming green spaces, it's not just about nature blooming, it's about us. And how do we create cities and spaces that bring the best out in us, that, that connect us to the planet and the wider ecological environment and the situation that we find ourselves in? Richard, coming to you, I mean, how, can you tell us about your journey to get to this point? What, 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 uh, what has inspired you to, to, to go on this path of, of, of building these fantastic walls that we see behind us? And, and, and where do you see us going in the future indeed? Well, so my background is in construction. Um, I uh, have a full background in construction. Started working on the Channel Tunnel, 
and then various other civil engineering projects. And so as the years went on, I started looking at the way the construction industry was working and how, particularly from an environmental point of view, it wasn't really taking account of the environment. It didn't care how much concrete it was pouring in, steel, uh, contractually at the time as well, there was, there was a lot of stuff going on between companies which made it really difficult to hold, have proper relationships with people. And quite frankly as well, there was a, there was a difference in terms of the um, sort of demographic within construction. So you have this male dominated industry uh, that is very contractual, that doesn't really care about the environment. So I moved out of that into sustainable construction. And I just met a guy, so me from construction background, I met a landscape architect, landscape designer, who was looking at a guy called Mark Lawrence, who was looking at uh, a, a contract to potentially green uh, London School of Economics. Found they had very little horizontal landscape. Started looking vertically and said, knowing I was working in buildings, asked, how do I fix plants to buildings? And that's how it kind of all started, and we moved on from there. And it's the opportunity to, to bring sustainability at a, at a larger sort of scale. Uh, than working in small-scale sustainability. And I believe just moving on from what Oliver was talking about, where the problem is, there is an element of our definition of sustainability being an issue. So we talk about the sort of triple bottom line of people, planet, profit, and it's like a three-legged stool here, and they have to be the same length, otherwise they wobble. And so you look at the need to satisfy the profit element and society and the environment, whereas actually that's not the way it works. The way it works is the profit element or the financial element sits within society and should serve society and society sits within a planet and the planet is a finite resource so how we consider we can grow infinitely into a finite resource means that our sustainability needs to shift around to a more of a stronger way of thinking about it and so we say we want to reconnect with nature which implies there's been a disconnect from nature but the biggest problem that I see is the fact that we are not disconnected from nature and some of the problems that we see is our very connection to nature, the CO2 issues, the air pollution. We have caused that mm. because we are so connected to nature, mm. because we are biological beings. So we're going to have to think of a new strap line for planted in that case, Richard. but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a fundamentally difficult point to grasp, but, but also it's just so important, isn't it, that profit shouldn't be dismissed from the conversation profit needs to drive society but actually it's about how do we enable profit to happen which is also empathetic and, and sympathetic to the natural world around us. I mean, Mac, moving to you in terms of your, your experience here and indeed your experience of um, starting off something in a, in a, on a very kind of essentially a community based project which has indeed moved into a more commercial avenue as well. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about your story and, and the edible bus stop? Well, it, it, I, I kind of stumbled uphill into the world of, of, of creating green spaces in, in the urban realm. And it started because where I live, there was one piece of green space that was going to, I saw planning notice, and they were going to chop down a beautiful silver maple and build houses there. And I just felt really strongly about, we need that green space. And I didn't really have the language that I do now, but I, it was something that was, it was a sort of reaction within me. Um, so I sort of took it upon myself to leaflet the neighbourhood to warn them that this was happening and um, managed to get about 25 people to, uh, to have a meeting in the local pub. And um, whilst, whilst we were discussing how we felt about these potential buildings there, I asked um, those present, I said, did anyone else notice this square metre patch of guerrilla gardening that's been happening there in the past couple of years where people are growing edibles? And the reply was, yes, collectively, and everyone smiled. Amazing. And it was one of those eureka moments mm. I described as, and just, well, then why don't we do this? So, so that's how it started. But then after a year, um, having partnered with a landscape architect, Will Sandy, I, we both of us felt strongly about wanting to actually make this a permanent space. So we went about getting funding and created London's uh, first pocket park as part of the Mayor of London's program at that time and then since then we're an incorporated company now and uh, so we create sort of installations whether they are in permanent or temporary settings but I, I'd like I think the most important thing about them always is that a they're planted mm -hmm. uh, and b design is right there 
it's it's there, there has to be something quite quirky and interesting about it because um, I aim to get the community involved and you want to preach to the unconverted not just the people who know and understand gardens because a lot of people are nature blind almost. Mm, mm. and so through design I think you can bring them in in another way that's, that's a really interesting point I mean Oliver for you I mean I guess and, and something we've discussed within the planted team a lot is you know this movement seems to be growing it seems to be there seems to be a, a sort of a shift back towards us as Richard said not reconnecting necessarily with nature but certainly recognizing our role within the natural world but just take picking up on Max point there I mean how conscious do we have to be of not just speaking to other like-minded people but how and how do we move forward to actually engage with people who really don't have a, a sense of nature or the benefits that I mean, Matt mentioned that everyone's smiling in the pub and in really simple terms for me it's just I just feel happy when I'm around or happier around nature how, how do we go around getting that really sort of quite soft message across in a stronger stronger term I think fundamentally everybody has had positive experiences of nature and you just kind of create you know evocative messages that takes them back to that so you know people spend the holidays going to beaches and forests and mountains and there are really very strong moments in there so I think you know it's a universal design ethos you know compared to many other design styles like minimalism or classicism or gothic revival whatever you're into everybody's had positive experiences of nature so the work that we do in biophilic design is about evoking some part of that memory and bring it into the built environment so I don't think the problem is that you know it's for some people and not others the problem is um, it's creating the business case and saying you know it's not just a sort of nice to have it's actually an essential component of a building of a street of a neighborhood of a city and what we have to do is just capture the the, the metrics or the business case that underpins that to say actually you know and as the research demonstrates in many many building types bringing elements in or giving views out onto elements of nature improves the, the, the intended function of that building you know we can create hospitals where patients get better uh, nearly 10% faster with views onto trees uh, to, can take 22% less medication we can create schools where children can learn fast and get better test results uh, offices where people are 6% more productive where they feel more engaged and more valued that attract staff so bringing nature in um, is good for business and I think what's interesting about this evidence-based approach is that all the statistics are out there um, it may be that they're at the end they've happened to another company in a, another time period in another in, a, in another place but we need to kind of keep measuring and testing that and carrying out post occupancy evaluations and strengthening that business case to say you know nature's not just good for us it's good for business and like you say it's good for the planet and that, that's a key point, isn't it, Richard, in terms of, and we go back to this idea of profit, but, it, but it, if profit isn't a part of the driver of this, it's, it, it can't really succeed, can it? And, and how do you, as a, as a businessman and, um, and someone who, who recognises the value, go about making sure that you can be commercially successful, but also be sympathetic and empathetic? And I'm talking in terms of the, the structure that's behind here as well, the actual product that you're, you're putting together. But... Um, how, can you elaborate a little bit on that point? So I think, yeah, I think it's interesting that, that we need to be looking at the return on investment that we can offer and give. And return on investment is a very business type word, but we can talk about return on investment from an environmental point of view and a social point of view, as well as from a profit point of view. And bringing nature back into cities is about, there's two things that nature does for us. One is the physical properties that it has, where it can mitigate, it can do, it can help with air quality, it can look at noise, uh, noise reduction, um, it can deal with heat issues as well, either within buildings or within urban heat island effect. The other thing it does is it enriches environments, makes us happier and healthier and therefore more creative and productive. And study after study show multiple benefits from air quality to productivity and creativity through to staff well-being, staff retention. And these are, these are a massive return on investment and, and we're seeing that from a business point of view we're starting to talk to corporations who are seeking to create communities uh, within their workplaces and not just workstations but communities 
And as people are starting to, and I think reconnecting with nature is a good phrase, mm. and we just have to recognise that the actions that we've done to the planet haven't been in a bubble of it's our own, sure. and nature's in another bubble, we, we, we actually impact on the planet. Um, I think it's important to recognise that um, there really is a business case that comes as part of what we do, but it needs for me to be an environmental and social one. So, for example, the wall we have here is fabricated from our new plant box, uh, freestanding stackable modular units that are all made from 100% UK post-consumer waste. So they're all plastic that's been recycled. Um, they're built to last and built, for, built, built to be kind of handed on if you finish mm. using them. Um, and they also have a social message to them as well. So we, we, we donate to a charity with every one that we, that we put in. So we want to aim for that sort of triple bottom line in terms of what we're looking at without it being this, this three-legged stool. Mm. You know, people often say to me, you know, when we do a venture, well, it has to make sense commercially. And I get that, and I understand it has to make sense commercially, but actually, for me, it has to make sense environmentally. Mm. Because if it doesn't make sense environmentally, I don't want really to be part of it, because it, it just doesn't make sense for a sustainable, long-term future. I think for, for us, uh, planted and, um, you know, Oliver's made some, some critical interventions at various points along the, the point to getting to this point where we're at actually had a physical have a physical offering to, sh to show people but it was a moment where he presented that idea that when people are connected they have an innate need to feel connected to nature we are as you've talked about part of the natural environment we're not in any way separate you know we, we are absolutely part of a, of, of, a, of, a, of, of the planet and the natural world but by being connected to nature you've increase productivity, increase creativity, you feel better about yourself. So that idea of a happy workforce, and I guess yes. now in the kind of COVID world that sadly we find ourselves in, um, there's a lot of talk around bringing people back into the office or how companies are gonna work with their, their employees. I mean, is, it, is that more relevant now than ever, that idea of building a sense of community within your, your team, your, your, your employees, your, your co-workers? Definitely, and, and if you look at some of the, one of the interesting stats that's come out of lockdown is the, um, the, the in the first half of 2020, uh, gardening was the most read magazine topic. Now that may not surprise you, but in the first half of 2019, gardening didn't even make it to the top 10 of magazine topics. So that shows how interesting or interested we have become in reconnected with nature, in becoming bird watchers, in recognizing you know, beauty within nature. Um, and for corporations to start to want communities, communities are made of people. And if people want to be surrounded by nature, if people feel happier and healthier being surrounded by nature, um, then that is the way to engage uh, with them. And that's the way to create spaces for them to come into. That yes, have technology in them, absolutely. But unless we're rooted in that biology as well, uh, it's not gonna be a place that people are gonna be feel pretty comfortable to come back into. And how about green screens just to separate barrier mm. between mm. people? Um, something lovely to look at and you're creating that barrier. So there, is, there are many options with, with biology in places. Um, Matt, that must be exciting to hear from you. Gardening's going up the agenda. It yeah. certainly did in the, in the Peters household, but uh, I'm sure lots of people watching now um, would share that, that sense that... Uh, Absolutely. I think that's one of the upsides of what's happened in the pandemic is that the focus went outwards into nature, into parks. Our parks became vital mm. to our survival, absolutely intrinsic. Mm. So I think there's been a, a great awakening for people now that this is really, this is really important. People want flats with gardens now. You're not going to be able to, you know, it's much harder to rent if you don't have a garden or a balcony or some kind of outdoor space. So that that's been a massive shift, I think. And and one thing that will come about from this, hopefully is the, this triple bottom line is that who holds the, the purse strings will understand we're going to have to plant a lot more mm -hmm. and, and, and instead of designing spaces with planting as an afterthought it should be right there central to how that space is because a, a, a tree lined avenue the houses are far more valuable than one with no trees mm -hmm. um, just shopping centers with good you know planting arrangements and landscaping more likely to have people dwelling, staying longer, spending money. It all adds up. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just that 
physical health and the emotional health, it does actually make you know monetary sense yeah. to invest into these green spaces. And that, that's I mean, we're sitting in this Granary Square at King's Cross, this beautiful space, and you know Dan Pearson's had a, a huge influence on the on the space around, and that's certainly a, a significant reason that that, um, that we chose to put planted here. I mean, Oliver Mac talked about you know building and, and what do we need to do in to sort of you know change the way that our cities look and you know we've talked before about Boris's uh, and the, the government's call to build 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 I mean can we explore that idea and what that means for the for those of us here sat around this, this in this space for the green cities of the future how if we do we need to build 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 or, or and if we do how do we build 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 yeah, I don't think there's any point in building for the sake of building if you're not taking human well-being into consideration. So along with that idea that we should be building houses, offices, schools, is that connection to nature. Um, and we like to think of it as a, as a sort of nature diet. That if you know, you've got buildings, you've got to be thinking about the human experience. And that actually on a daily basis, we should be having a connection with plants and trees and flowers and bees and butterflies and fauna and flora. Um, and then maybe on a, on a weekly basis, you'll go and visit a local park that's a little bit further away. Or on a monthly basis, you'll go and visit an area of outstanding beauty, natural beauty. And on a, a more annual basis, maybe the higher carbon level thing is that you'll go a little bit further and spend more time more deeply immersed. So we have this sort of triangle that we, we should be embedding into our approach to the creation of cities, that we've got to do it not just on a sort of timely basis, but sort of in terms of our proximity, and whether it's you know in our homes, on our desks, but also on our streets and neighbourhoods and cities, and then as a sort of national approach, we've got to be integrating that sense of nature. You can't separate out these two things of sort of urbanism and greenery, they've got to go together in order to facilitate happy and healthy cities and desirable spaces uh, that are fit for the future. Mac, I know you've got some, some strong views here, but I mean, build, 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 what should we, what sh uh, what my, should we my, be doing? My response to that is plant, plant, plant. Yeah. And, and until we put that front and centre, the, the build, build, build will kill us. Mm. We're, we're, as we were discussing before we came on air, we're in the sixth mass extinction. It is happening right now, and it's happening on our watch. So, creating blooming cities makes you feel good, but it's also vital to our survival. And, and, and so, unless we start, this, this, the planners, everyone has to put that, the, the, nest, the need for planting, whether it's trees, or green walls, or pocket parks, or even unusual sites where you weren't expecting some greenery. It's all so important, and, and it gets, of course, for the mental and emotional well-being, but I think it's for our survival. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an absolutely central point here that we can't escape from the previous talk. And uh, Andrew War said uh, that we indeed are the most important species, uh, human race of, of all time, I think I'm paraphrasing, but Oliver, I mean, I know you watched the Attenborough documentary and your family did as well. What was what was their response? I mean, Max just said, essentially, if we don't fix this, it's it's beyond serious, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, what the Attenborough show, the Extinction show did is sort of just pulled the veil back and going, you know, the real world isn't, you know, all fluffy puppies and, you know, TV shows and adverts and consumer adverts that kind of are calming and soothing. This is what's really happening. And it just kind of like, it was absolutely shocking. We all, these are things that we kind of know about, but you know, what the Extinction Show did was kind of pull it together and in a very accessible way to a mass audience. And, and it really brought about our, our, the reality that, that humans have seen themselves as, you know, the, the peak of a triangle um, and the master of nature, which is all, you know, ready to plunder. And the reality is, is you know, paraphrase a popular children's film, we're much more part of the circle of life. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that circularity. Sad. Yeah, is, is well, exactly. We, we exist critical, within it. You can't yeah. just take out certain uh, species or fauna and expect the whole thing to remain stable. Mm. You know, we're very much connected, deeply rooted, and connected to it. And what we're seeing, as Max says, is you know, this mass extinction, and we're seeing vital parts of the ecosystem being removed. 
and that's terrifying. But we, you know, we do have the opportunity to address this. Yeah. We, we're adaptable, we're enormously capable, we've got the skills and the resources, the knowledge. We can go and do stuff and we can make it better. We can bring nature back into our cities and as a, as a, as a global environment, our population, we're becoming much, much more urbanised. We've got to be creating cities that properly support human life and health and well-being. And going back to the back to Covid which is a, a negative but if there are some positives to come from it Richard I guess it's we've had this time that Mac talked about that others have talked about in terms of um, to, to, to find our, our way in nature and appreciate just how important it is when everything else gets stripped back the consumer society that we live in gets stripped back and we can't go to the shops we can't go to the theatre we can't go and do the things we th are important but perhaps we Put them higher up on the list than they were and actually it was the parks and it was the green spaces that, that kind of kept us going and indeed continue to do and a, a couple of questions perhaps if i may for you but one how do we maintain that going forward how do we how do we ensure that it's not just a short-term window and, and also or perhaps after that we could pick up on the idea that even if you don't have access in your flat or house if you're lucky enough to own a property that how you can actually make the most of every single living space and I'll also ask you about that as well Oliver if we could but uh, so I know there's a couple of questions in one there but starting off with the first. Yeah so the first one was <clears throat> based around um Remind me the first question. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it was a good one. How do we maintain it, momentum? How do we maintain momentum in simple terms? Yeah. Great question. So so I would say that what we are doing with biology and plants and nature isn't like double glazing or a, or a, a conservatory. It's not a fad or a phase. Nature was around kind of before us actually mm. and will be around after us. So for us to maintain momentum, I think it's vital that we do so. Um, I kind of feel we're at an interesting, interesting time where carrying on from the sixth extinction period mm. thing, as individuals and then corporately and as a society, we need to engender this idea of environmental stewardship. Mm. We need to move this forward. We need to, we need to recognise our, our, you know, our place in the planet. And, and Oliver's circular life thing is really good, but there's a, there's a North American Indian woman who says we are part of the web of life and whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Mm. Um, and, and what we do, biotechnology, is we, we look at designing, growing, installing, maintaining green infrastructure within the urban realm. And it, it sounds bizarre, but it's a new thing. Having green infrastructure within the urban environment, designing it into urban design, is somehow new, which I find really strange because nature's been around for so long. So it's viewed by construction, it's very suspicious. Mm. You know, it's not brick, it's not block, it's not glass. Um, they can't put a U-value to it. They can't do all this sort of stuff. And I think that it's really, really important that we keep the momentum up of how we can in, introduce green into urban spaces, whether that's in external spaces, on buildings, in buildings, by the return on investment conversation, um, but also by looking at some of the elements of compliance and how we can get the green to actually be a recognised part of the urban realm, a recognised part of what we actually put into buildings. By talking about you know, green infrastructure consultancy, for example, should really start existing as a discipline because it sits halfway between architecture and landscape architecture. We understand the value of good architecture, we understand the value of good landscape architecture, but somewhere in the middle is how we put plants in on and around buildings. It's a very little understood thing. So people say, well, I'll put a green wall over there, and they've, they're not talking to an expert. And there are now becoming some experts who know where the best value comes from putting green. Oliver being one of those. I of was going to mention that Oliver may just be one of those people. So indeed, <laughs> Oliver, if we could just ask you, I mean, going back to, to Mac's point there about, um, you know, the, this idea that, and it's, um, it's absolutely true, I'm sure that it's harder now to rent a property if it doesn't have a, an outdoor space. And, you know, conversely, that implies, I, I guess, that it's, it's more challenging for, because people desperately want to have that outdoor space but you're a, a strong believer I know in the idea that you can still be connected with nature in 
all manner of different ways in, in indoor spaces indeed and and your your home is testament to that i know because i saw it repeatedly via zoom uh during lockdown and banging on about biophilic design banging on yeah. about biophilic <laughs> design but but to tell us a little bit to, yeah. to the to the uninitiated you know what what you can do in your home yeah. to well, enable nature to, to well, feel part of them biophilic design essentially um it's kind of there are three core aspects the first and most powerful of course is how we reconnect or uh, connect with nature and natural processes so plants and trees and water and natural light of course have an enormously deep physiological and psychological benefit but in many cases and particularly in the currently existing built environment it's often quite difficult to bring those real forms of nature in so actually what research has shown is that a number of what called indirect references to nature how we mimic and evoke a feeling in nature in buildings still have some physiological benefit so um, you know plants uh, sorry so colors materials textures and we all know that those kind of things can change the way a space feels and actually the research shows that when we have real timber walls in classrooms it can actually reduce heart rates of students by 7600 beats per day so you know it's reducing their heart rates uh, making them feel less stressed more able to focus so there are a number of little things that we can do in a way yes it's absolutely mimicking nature mm. but in spaces where we can't bring real nature in that's that's one thing the other thing to do is recognize that as human beings we are actually kind of animals mm -hmm. as one type we we do need to create spaces that are exciting and stimulating that engender conversations but also and particularly in our always on world we do need to be creating spaces that just allow us to stop pause reflect and recuperate and that's something that i think is missing from many sort of forms of housing and offices and our cities you know we can't just be on the go all the time we have to kind of create these spaces that do allow us to properly connect with nature to to dig to grow to nurture and and those recuperative spaces are incredibly important and not to be undervalued mm. i map the work that you guys do in 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 a cities in in in, yeah. in urban spaces i mean that is they are areas that are probably fairly um, associated with a, a lack of access to, to nature and, and, and green spaces or a relative lack of, lack of nature but also this idea I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about where uh, where green spaces are exist but access is denied essentially how, how do we go about actually reopening some of these green spaces in London and other UK cities to, to enable more access well that, that's actually a huge issue the, the areas that we are not allowed to be in mm. and, and parks that were closed for instance there was the example in Rockwell Park during yep. the, the pandemic and uh, the lockdown it was shocking that people weren't allowed to be in the park um, uh, how we unlock those spaces mm -hmm. I'm still working on that right. yeah um, personally I'm looking at spaces that are the more desolate and the more grey they are, the more interesting they are for me to transform, yeah. the more impact you're going to have by putting greenery there. The greenery that's locked to us, I don't know. Would you <laughs> I think we just have to get creative, don't we? Like, like Rich's sort of starting point was like, well, we've got all this vertical space. What, mm. what could that do? I mean, this whole thing is like a little bit of a like a green hug. hug, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it you is. We just kind of like <laughs> yeah. it's in our periphery vision. It's around. It's got this beautiful, gentle movement. It's very calming and soothing. It changes the acoustics. You know, this is cr this is literally placemaking, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. With, without this here, this is just open to the rest of this enormous square. It creates no sense of desire. But this has created a you know a beautiful, interesting, engaging place. So we just have to get creative, I guess, don't yeah. we? Yeah, I think going, that's our only choice. Going, going back to um, the idea of strong sustainability as well, there's a, a report commissioned by Landscape Institute on the amount of money spent on upkeep of parks. But it says for every one pound spent on upkeep of parks, it saves society seven pounds. Yes. But somewhere they've got to find that budget for that one pound. Now, now how is a society, have we got to the stage where we can't find that one pound budget when we see the seven pounds? Yeah. Why is there a disconnect within our economy within our society within how we view the value of our people and well-being that we can't see that hang on there's actually a circular return on investment here by spending a pound on this we save on health and well-being over here and hospital emissions and mental health issues and all that sort of stuff i think that's a really interesting question for us as a society in terms of how do we how do we square this off the, um, the, the, the fact that local councils have these budgets that are straining at the bit 
and the, the, a lot of the money is going towards mental health services or you know hospitals you know all those care trusts etc and meanwhile I'm battling to get a budget to create a pocket park that there, there, there is they, they, they are the same thing as well exactly mm. that will help save money from over there Correct. and that, they, that that those dots need to be joined up it's starting to happen I mean we, we're seeing and hearing that uh, Doctors, I think it's in Scotland, are now prescribing time spent in nature mm -hmm. uh, to overcome stress and anxiety. We've seen people, uh, doctors, sort of prescribing park run as well. Mm -hmm. You know, time spent in, in communities, in nature, in cities, physical activity spent, you know. Um, so, there is, there, you know, there's definitely a, a change in tide from the medical profession of, of recognising this value. But again, I guess, in, you know, I, Part of what Planted is, is is unashamedly trying to educate, educate each other, educate a wider audience, and 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 learn all the way through as well. But I guess part of it as well is, I guess, if we're talking about a, a political conversation as well, recognizing that it's not that new. This idea is it. It's not a you know this is something that's been been going on for forever. Going back to I guess Richard's original or one of the original points that we're we're part of this planet, we're part of this system, and human beings have always look to be part of cities and urban spaces of what once cities have come about that have a, an innate connection with the natural world I just maybe sort of move, moving on a little if I could just to sort of you know a kind of call to arms in a way about what, what we need to do like um, you know I, I, I get that there's clearly opportunity here there's vertical opportunities there's creative opportunities to, to bring green spaces but do we, do we also have to kind of recognise that there's a big political conversation that needs to be had here that's also, you know, being bold and, and, and that's not being confrontational, it's about bringing people together on this journey. But um, we have to take, this has to be something that the top of our society recognise and perhaps the commercial drivers that, that we've alluded to are, are part of that conversation. But Mac, if I could put that one to you, I mean, what's the, what, what are the big action points we need to make in the next five, ten years, because it's a... It's well, a just got sorry to put you on the side, have got to plant yeah. more, you're right. Yeah. Got plant well, that more. is a big part, isn't you it? You know, planting is a revolutionary act. Yes. It is. It's, that's why I call myself an activist. Interesting, yeah. The, the politics and planting, are, it should be... It is. It's political. Mm -hmm. And so, whether you're gorilla gardening, or whether you're getting trees onto Waterloo Bridge during Extinction Rebellion protests, they became acts of protest. Mm -hmm. So, the it can't it can't be separated I think I feel it's it's sort of one and the same so I would encourage people just to get planting mm. Oliver what would you say need what needs to be done going forward what what what, what you know you you talk to about the extinction process we know that we're the we're the kind of generation or the the people who have humanity that could be it could be on our watch that things well indeed things are going horribly wrong in terms yeah. of biodiversity loss what how I do we think change um, we need to get more deeply connected with nature, and it can start in a very, very simple way with just a, you know a plant on your desk, or maybe mm. uh, kind of row of plants by your window, or a herb garden, or something on your balcony, or maybe looking after your garden and, and seeing it as a you know these are the kind of little motivators to engender larger actions, and recognizing that actually it does give you pleasure, and that actually gives you pleasure, it also gives the people around you. Maybe it's your boss, maybe it's the people who you work with. But see that as a kind of an expanding opportunity of recognising the need to kind of bring nature in, um, not just to your, your desktop, your balcony, your garden, but to look after the nature in your park and your local area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, and realise that scale and recognise that we, we do need to be more deeply uh, connected, but also responsible for nature because, you know, our health and wellbeing is intrinsically connected to it. Nature survives we survive if it doesn't you know that is it yeah, yeah. You know? so we've got to look after it appreciate it love it and and it will look after us that idea of nurturing is really important it's about caring isn't it and that's that's something we shouldn't be ashamed to to talk about it's something we should be really proud of i think you know the communities that have responded so well to mm. covid are the ones that have looked out for each other and we also talked richard about that idea of um businesses and uh, organizations building communities i mean you guys, Biotech, were a big part of the uh, the, night, the White Nightingale um, XL project, weren't you? The Nightingale Hospital. Um, I mean, how much of that social conscious drove you your decision to, to participate and, and oh. donate 
Oh, so much product to that to that project. Well, um, that all came about because two weeks after lockdown, um, when it felt like the whole business was going to fall off the edge of a cliff, and we had no work, and we're going to, you know, fold as a company after 13 years within four weeks of lockdown, um, which didn't come to pass, of course. Um, we wanted to do something, and I was called up by Mace, who were looking at the Nightingale Hospital and doing some stuff for the the nurses in the scrub station out there and that they put some porter cabins out which is where the nurses would come to collect their scrubs for the day and then go and do their day's work inside the Nightingale Hospital and then come back at the end of the day um, and it was a bunch of porter cabins on a steel metal deck and it just looked like um, it looked like some sort of a second world war camp or something like this um, and they asked us what we could do and um, well we had a bit of time on our hands um, and so we thought do you know what forget business for a little bit we'll go and do something um, interesting instead uh, and so we got together with a bunch of local businesses I got Patrick Collins who's a Chelsea garden designer to help me design the space and we looked at that and we got local suppliers providing all sorts of stuff we put up 75 square meters of green wall we had um, it was AstroTurf so it was plastic but it was covering the steel surface so uh, that went down some benches and some tables and we worked it over three days but the actual installation on site was only one day so we had some people who came to collect their scrubs in the morning on this metal deck uh, and they came back in the afternoon to this garden oasis and two or three of them just burst into tears straight away in terms of you know just seeing what had been been you know been carried out on their behalf if you like and it was our way of saying thank you and for a couple of our staff including our operations director he said it's the best day's work he's ever done mm -hmm. So it's that idea of just being, you know, being fulfilled and, and how we can do that. So, you know, I think there is a place for, and we've done the same at the Bristol Royal Infirmary as well. Um, we, but that's a, that's a permanent garden. Mm. And an interesting story there is that one of our guys, whose two children were shielding for 13 weeks because of breathing difficulties, uh, he lives in London. He's so thankful to the NHS that he drives to Bristol once a month to look after their garden and back again and won't awesome. accept any pay nice. to go and do that, you know. So this is about connecting with people. It's about understanding some of the issues of the, of the world and where that goes. I was really interested in the question you were asking about, you know, what we need to do politically at a political level, just from the point of view of green infrastructure and, and what we're trying to do and compliance. So some of the issues around fire, for example, uh, which is a very risky thing to be discussing and talking about when we talk about cladding on buildings. Of course, yeah. um, there's no one really batting on the side of nature within Parliament. Because nature isn't a product, nature isn't a thing. So you have the Concrete Society spending tens of thousands of pounds lobbying Parliament saying every building should be concrete only. You have the Timber Society doing various bits. You have the Window Society. No one is talking about the natural world. And so we have a project in Greenwich, for example, um, that one side of government, the planning authority, said we have to put a big green wall on this, this here. And building control turned around and said you can't do a big green wall because of the potential fire risk. No one's batting on behalf of nature. And I think one of the things we need to do politically, and this is why this is a great move forward, this planted thing, because it needs, we need to give nature a voice yeah. and we need to be lobbying for nature. You can't patent nature, yeah. and that's why you can't. You know, that's yeah. why we can't have a concrete society around it or a nature society that has enough clout and voice to do that. So it needs an upswelling. It needs a growing revolution of sort of people to come up and people like Matt to mm. just get people to grow and grow and grow and plant and plant and plant. Yeah. Perhaps the next series of talks might be around Planted's view on proportional representation or first past the post voted <laughs> to enable the Green Party to get more of a voice at the exactly, table that, but I'd be for that. I, I, I think it's um, you know that is a really really interesting point and uh, one that I'm sure we all should look and ca will look to, to develop further I mean perhaps just finally as we as we wrap up I mean you know there's, there's reasons to be cheerful here aren't there I know it's easy to get caught up in the the now and and you know there's a lot of negativity around our, the state of our world and, and rightly so let's not let's not duck away from that but there's clearly a, enough people around who care it's just about engagement but you know if I could just ask you each for one final point um, perhaps starting with you Oliver just you know why why should we be optimistic what what is there to be optimistic about and and yeah just 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 that yeah I think there's an ever deeper recognition of the enormous value that nature and the natural realm plays in our lives 
and the understanding that we are deeply and intrinsically connected to it and reliant on it. And uh, when more people are talking about it, there's more call to action and people are getting involved. So there is a, a general spirit of activity, action, demonstration that is just like people doing amazing things. You know, David Attenborough, but Greta Thunberg as yeah. well, you know, that new generation. <clears throat> and you know what we need to do, you know, as a, as a Generation X is do as much as we can to support them. And, and you know, get out there, help them, and make them be the change that we need. Mac, if I could ask you, what, what's what, what's out there to be optimistic about? Well, nature always bats last. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> for sure. It might not be um, how she gave us, but she will bat last. And I know the blossoms will come next spring. Mm. So that's that's for me. That keeps me going. The, the fact that plant life will keep going some way in some form and that there has been this amazing awakening this year towards how important our green spaces are so i'm very optimistic we're setting out for landscapes of the future to be a mix of biology and technology and we start to talk to clients about this about smart green cities and there are a number of clients who are really getting this message and starting to talk about it and I'd love to see it come to fruition but unless they start talking about it it's not actually going to start moving forward so I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by a number of clients that we're talking to who are starting to seek this idea of more holistic landscapes um, and, and that's what we need to do so yeah that's fantastic points to end on from all of you I mean from my point of view um, my reason to be optimistic is certainly just in the last few days alone, certainly over the last few months and years, but if anything, just the fact that we've been able to bring you guys together and also the fantastic roster of speakers, Oliver, that you've put together over the last few days has, well, a lot, and, and it's come about in the last few days and has, has happened, uh, you know, today really with filming, but it's, you know, there are so many people that we've met who are coming together and, and there will be more and more, I've no doubt, in due course. And as we look to put our own physical event on next May the, in, a, in a bigger scale than we've been able to put on this week you know I've got absolute confidence that people are just going to come on board here and, and that's that's a big reason for me optimistic for us and um, yeah I think uh, let's go forth let's let's keep the conversation going and you know I'm hugely grateful to all of you for joining us today um, and indeed all the work that you've put in in putting this whole talk, Planted Unplugged Talks program together and your team as well Oliver so a big thank you to Oliver Heath Design for sure but to everyone today you know it just leaves it for me to to wrap things up for Planted Unearthed that was that was Blooming Buildings um, and uh, we will uh, be back again in the future the back next May 2021 we're looking forward this has been the first uh, planted unearthed and uh, the first planted iteration um, thanks so much to the whole planted team uh, who've been part of this uh, this production process um, it's been a lot of fun and will continue to be so no doubt as we move forward in the future but uh, I'd also like to thank our partners Biotecture for this fantastic structure um, that they've put up behind us I think we're going to be great partners together in the future and um, to Richard and all your team thank you very much for everything Pleasure. you've done um, to Vestra the fantastic furniture that's uh, that's been around um, it was no surprise to me yesterday that Dezine, another partner of ours, um, uh, actually said it's the number one furniture product in terms of their uh, sustainability credentials. Vestra come right out of the top, so I'm delighted to have been uh, we've, that we've been able to partner with them during this whole uh, production process. So thank you to Vestra, to Equinox Kombucha, to our official hand sanitizers Bramley. It's one of the most beautiful smelling products I've ever known. So please go out and buy some Bramley and it's uh, extremely uh, high alcohol content as well. So it kills all the nasty bugs. To Angle Poise, to Stormboard, who built this fantastic um, recycled and recyclable circular product behind us. This will be coming with us when we pack everything up on Sunday um, and will be available for you all to look and observe and admire in uh, uh, planted shows to come in the future. Uh, again, to all our guests here, uh, to everyone who's been part of the Planted Unplugged series, thank you, and especially to Oliver and his team. My name's Sam Peters, and this has been Planted Unplugged.